Good day, everybody. Thanks for joining us once again. This is Phil Rosengren with BetterPitching.com, and uh, we got a special treat for you guys. We have with us tonight a, a former pro pitcher. Um, he's actually a sidearm, or was a sidearm pitcher, uh, now turned successful businessman and tech entrepreneur. Um, and there's actually a good chance you're familiar with this company. We're talking with the, the co-founder and CEO of Game Changer, Ted Sullivan. Ted, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, you got it, man. And I uh, just want to give you guys a little bit of background before we get, get rolling here. If, um, you know, if you guys out there are involved in organized baseball at the youth, high school, college level, um, there's a good chance you know these guys, Game Changer, because, um, you know, in, in case you're hiding under a rock, Game Changer is the, the leading scorekeeping app on the market. Um, they also deliver live game updates, stats, um, and stories to parents and families out there and, uh, and fans out there. So um, just looking at some quick highlights here, Ted, um, I see that the app's now been used to score more than 2 million games since its inception. Um, right. You got partnerships with Little League, Cal Ripken, Babe Ruth, Perfect Game. Um, some, some key partnerships there, used by over 60,000 youth, high school, and college teams, um, and over 90,000 coaches. So, you know, some pretty impressive numbers there. You guys have been, been doing all right, I guess. We've been busy. We've been busy. <laughs> we got a long way to go, but we've been busy. I can imagine. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, guys, uh, you may be familiar with Game Changer. Either you've, uh, you've used it or you have friends who use it. Uh, but what you may not know is that Ted was a pitcher himself, and he pitched at, at Duke University and then went on to pitch in the Cleveland Indians organization. And actually, Ted and I were teammates uh, in the Indians organization and pitched together in the minor leagues together. Um, so we go way back. And I can tell you, he's a class act and, and quality guy all the way around. So for me personally, that. yeah, man, um, that's what, like for me personally, it's just really cool to see what you've been able to do with Game Changer and the, the success it's having, how you guys are taking off. Um, and, and, you know, I'm, I really appreciate you taking the time out to be with us here tonight. Of course. Well, yeah, I certainly can't take um, take all the credit. You know, we've got a great a great team here working on Game Changer, and uh, you know, um, a lot a lot of time and effort from a lot of different people put in to you know get where we are. No doubt, sure. Um, and I definitely want to talk about that, but I also wanted to get you on. I'm really glad you were able to come on because you've got a really unique and interesting baseball story. When you just think of of like your whole story in baseball, going to, to Duke and playing in the minors, and now taking what you've you know learned in, in business school and applying that and bringing it together with your baseball background. Um, but first off, just kind of talking about, kind of digging into the, the baseball background, you were a sidearm pitcher. Um, so I was wondering if you could kind of share a little bit about what, you know, what that was like, what that was about, because um, it's different in that not a lot of coaches out there really know um, you know, hands-on what it's like to be a sidearm pitcher. And for young pitchers out there trying to be a sidearm pitcher, it's, it's got to be tough to, to learn that uh, from the outset. So at what point did you kind of decide that, okay, I'm going to commit to being a sidearm pitcher and this is the way I'm going to gonna pitch? Yeah, you know, I, I wish I could say it was a story of, um, you know, growing up being, having, having the dream of being a sidearm, sidearm <laughs> pitcher. Um, I was probably, you know, somewhat late to the game uh, when it came to dropping my arm angle down actually when like growing up I actually threw it as a pitch yeah you know so in little league and even up through junior high and high school um, not as much in high school but but I think a lot of you know you could sort of screw around and like you know drop your arm angle down right, and sure everyone messes mess around, around. With it. Yeah. yeah exactly and sometimes I'd, I'd even do it in games but a lot of times um, you know I think because I was also an infielder so you sort of get used to to, to throwing a lower arm angle mm -hmm. and um, and so anyway the the what 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 drove it was that you know, I got to college. I was an overhand pitcher in high school. Mm -hmm. um, got recruited and went to Duke as an overhand pitcher, um, and actually then um, didn't switch like really commit to switching until my junior year at Duke. Oh wow! Okay. So it was a a, a, a really um, particularly late. You know, I think all things considered, mm -hmm. um, and the and the reason really just came down to the fact that I didn't have the stuff to. Mm -hmm. To miss a lot of barrels in <laughs> um, you know in the ACC, yeah. and so had to had to make some adjustments. And um, you know when you're when you're sitting and watching a lot of baseball games, you're not being consistent on the mound. When you do get an opportunity, forces you you know you can go two ways. You can either hang it up, hmm. right? You can sort of either either give up or transfer or whatever, throw in the towel in some way, right? Um, 
or you just sort of keep working, keep tweaking, keep figuring out what you can do to get better. And that's what I did. I can, you know, to work really hard to make myself sort of bigger, stronger, faster. Mm -hmm. um, but but it still became clear after a good you know two and a half plus years in college that I that my stuff wasn't going to be good enough for me to be like sort of a, a either either you know, front of the rotation or really for me it was me is a front of the bullpen type of pitcher. Right. And so I started to make some adjustments with my grip and my arm angle and a bunch mm -hmm. of other things around my approach to batters and it, it happened to really click for me. Yeah, obviously it did. I mean then you went on to pitch it well, with the Indians. So you know something came together there for you. I think that's a good lesson for guys that you have to kind of, you know, always be striving to get better and finding ways that you can improve. And if something's not working um, you know, take a look at, at what you're doing and figure out a way to, to get it done. So that's yeah. I mean, one of the things I always tell high, you know, I know you work with a lot of high school ball players. One of the things I tell high school ball players as they're going into college and and and, and even college freshmen, mm -hmm. it's a very tough adjustment period, right? You know, right. the, game, the yeah. game changes a lot, yep. hitters change a lot, um, and there's there there. You know, I've talked to more than one. I'm sure you've done mm -hmm. the same thing. You probably worked with more than one college, you know, sort of freshman and college pitcher who's Sort of down on down on himself, and mm -hmm. and 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 doesn't is sort of lack lacks that confidence that that he had a matter of months earlier when right. he was dominating as a senior it in high school. It could be tough that first year, yeah. Re really tough. And I think one of the things I always try to put in perspective is is actually how long your college career is. I mm -hmm. think that a, a high school senior or a college freshman looks back at their high school career and it feels like it went by like that. You right. know, you look back and things always. <laughs> Seem like they went by really fast, right. but but then you think about the number of years, the number of months, the number of days you could be in the weight room. That you can actually improve something. You can develop a new pitch. You can mm -hmm. do whatever it is. You can change yourself physically, mentally, emotionally, and through you know your mechanics in a matter of time to make right. you a totally different pitcher. I've known, yeah, over your, the, the course your, of college for sure. Over the course of college. I mean, I was a totally different pitcher my senior year yeah. than I was when I came in as a freshman. Yeah, so. I can name yeah so many guys that I played with um, in college, like I myself and then other guys who just came in, you know, throwing one way. Um, you know, I probably put on a good 20 pounds my first couple of years and, yeah. um, you know, just gained velocity through that and hard work and training and, and things like that. So I can I can totally relate to that for sure. Absolutely. Um, let's talk a little bit about, you mentioned that transition from high school to college. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about being at Duke and what that was like because, um, you know, that's something I try to talk a lot about with guys too is sort of balancing the academics with the uh, the baseball side of it. And with Duke, you're talking obviously about a, a top academic institution, but then like you mentioned, it's in the ACC, which is probably, you know, is one of the top places you can play college in the country. Um, so what was that like having to balance the, the baseball side of it also with the, the academic demands that you had there? Yeah, you know, it, um, it's not easy, and I don't think it's necessarily unique at Duke. I think any, any, any university where there was, there's a high academic standard, um, you know, the, the time management is tough. You know, it's, it's funny. Growing up, my dad always told me that, you know, you've got three things in your life. You've got sports, you've got academics, and you've got social and you can be really good at two of them. So you got to pick. You got to pick which yeah. two you're going to be good at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, and 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 that's that's no doubt that that's the case in in college, especially when you're playing a you know 50 or 60 game schedule with half of them on the road. Um, you know, certainly during that second semester, that spring semester, when you're when you're playing so much. So you know, it was it was tough. I think that um, the unfortunate thing. In my opinion, is that the, the way that a good number of people, a number of college students manage this is they try to take the easy route academically. Mm -hmm. And the right. fact is, and there's another piece of advice I always give to high school ball players that are that are preparing to play in college. You know, there don't don't be surprised. You know, I, I sort of ruin ruin the, the pleasant surprise that they get when they get that. You know, when they get onto campus and they realize there is an easier route. And there's going to be a junior or senior on the team that's mm -hmm. going to tell you the easier route. Right. Here are the class. Here are the professors that like athletes. Here's the right. here's the program. Here's here's the path you could take. And is it every school? I'm telling. You, is it Duke? Is it the best academic schools in the country? Ivy League. You name it. Mm -hmm. And um, and then there's the path that you can follow, which is the stuff that you're interested in, and that mm -hmm. means taking some, you know, challenging yourself and taking some harder classes. Right. And um, you know, I, I, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, you know, I slipped up a little bit in the mm -hmm. in, in the early days when that, you know, when I was 
hit in the face by the time management challenges, and it was very easy to take that easier class. And then mm. as I sort of matured um, over my, my few years there, I realized it was crazy. It was a waste of my time to sit in a class I didn't care about with a professor right. that didn't, wasn't very good or, or whatever. And so really tried to challenge myself and take harder classes. And, mm. and I, I, you know, I certainly don't regret that at all, even though I probably had to sacrifice in other areas, whether it was sleep, social, mm. or whatever else. I think that's a good lesson too. Just you know, not trying to take the easy road all the time, but the the fact that if you're gonna, if you if, first of all, if you have that opportunity to be at a, a, a quality university like that, um, and you're you have access to all these professors and the the courses and everything, to take the easy route and um, not kind of challenge yourself is is like you said, kind of wasting your time. Incredible so, waste. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I definitely took that approach too. Like you said, the first couple of years was kind of like finding my way around, and um, it took a little while, but. Um, definitely kind of if you if you find things that you're interested in you're gonna work that much harder to uh, no you know it's gonna you're gonna get a lot more out of it rather than just whatever's easiest because then you're not gonna be passionate about it no um, doubt and that, that goes with the baseball side of it too I mean if you gotta have the love for the game and that's gonna drive you and you'll be able to then balance you know the Agreed. the books and the baseball um, but then you know so you mentioned that you didn't really things didn't really click for you in college baseball wise mm -hmm. until kind of your junior year so at what point for you did you start giving serious thought to the possibility of maybe playing beyond college and playing in the pros? Yeah, it's so the act, the honest, the honest, true story is sort of a funny, a funny story. And I say junior year. Junior year is when I started to really commit to, to, to a different arm angle. It was actually the second half of the junior, my junior year. Okay. It really wasn't until my senior year that I was kind of front of the bullpen um, and it started getting a lot of innings and a lot of appearances and pitching on the weekends. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so going into my senior year, I, there was exactly zero chance that I was going <laughs> to have, have a chance to play, play afterwards. Um, and uh, not that I didn't want to, and actually my brother was in the minor leagues at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and it was something that I would have loved to have been able to do, but I, there was no chance. I had basically, you know, I'd gotten a handful of innings for three years in a row. Right. And, um, and it was, I was so convinced, in fact, that I wasn't going to play minor league ball that I went through the whole um, hmm. uh, sort of investment banking interview process. I sort of followed the herd <laughs> and did that my, my, yeah. my fall semester there at Duke and ended up, um, you know, getting a few job offers and took one at Morgan Stanley in mm -hmm. Manhattan to do investment banking. Oh, so you were all think, lined up and ready to go. I don't even think I actually knew what investment banking was. <laughs> um, if they had asked that in the interview, I would have failed the interview. But I think all the bankers were more interested in talking about baseball and sports and Duke and everything else. That happens. And, but, so, but I got, so I had this job and I went into my spring season and things started to click and I, mm -hmm. you know, I, I threw the ball well. Um, always a little bit of luck and good fortune as well. You know, I had there were two guys, two of the starters on our team um, were 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 prospects, and so there were scouts in the stands. And of mm -hmm. course, when you go and play Clemson and Florida State and Georgia Tech on the road, yeah. there are going to be scouts in the stands there. Um, and so, it really, wasn't until the day of the draft <laughs> when I got picked, which was about ten days or two weeks before I was supposed to show up in Midtown Manhattan at Morgan Stanley. So it was, um, it was a phone call I'll never forget to Morgan Stanley saying, you know, thanks, but no thanks, but I'm going to go instead to, you know, uh, Niles, Ohio, and, and, and be yeah, a Mahoning right. Valley scrapper with you. Scrappers. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, man. I didn't even uh, realize that it got that deep as far it, as... Oh, it, got, it, it, was, it was that dangerous, I man. Mean, imagine how differently your life was going It was actually... Like, it, it, I, got, I got that close. I had gotten a sign... <laughs> bonus, which I thought was an incredible amount of money, 5,000 bucks, right? I got uh -huh. a signing bonus, not from the Indian, not from the Indian, right. I got from Morgan Stanley, right. which was spent, you know, which was spent by about February. Um, and, uh, and so I had to pay that back somehow. Oh, and of course, my signing bonus to the Indians didn't do any help right, uh, right. to pay that back. Uh, that's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, you mentioned now, obviously things came together for you as a side armor where mm -hmm. it, it, it just clicked and then know a year basically like a year plus later all of a sudden now you're you're able to become a professional pitcher so what advice would you give to to pitchers out there who are either aspiring side armors or mm -hmm. maybe kind of debating it thinking about do I try messing around with with committing to being a side armor and seeing if that works for me what would you yeah. tell guys you know I think that first and foremost you know I did it was something that did feel natural 
mm. to me. And I think, I, I don't know whether that was because as a kid, I, I, you know, I always try to think about that, you know, maybe because my brother and I sort of messed around with it, thought right. it was fun, you know, like growing up, you saw Dan Quisenberry, and you tried to sort of, <laughs> Yeah, I think I tried, I tried the same thing when I was a kid. What the too. quiz looked yeah. like, and it was always something that sort of came naturally. I, another factor, I, I grew up in the D.C. area and loved Cal Ripken. And Cal mm. Ripken, if you remember, when he had, had a very sort of sidearm sling across mm. the infield. And it was something that I probably sort of tried to imitate as a kid. Mm -hmm. And so it was something that, that generally was natu came naturally to me. And so I think that... Um, that when you start to make that switch, you have to trust your gut. Like, is this something that I can you know, that it is coming naturally enough to me where I can um, sort of evolve this into, into re it really working for me. And that's that's right. an individual decision. It was something that I felt it, it did come naturally. And then there are some other things just about sidearm throwing, which probably, you know, are, are beyond the scope of this interview. <laughs> but like cer right. certain things that I, that I had learned and I studied about sort of attacking the inside part of the plate and sort of letting the ball run. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really what, what sidearm throwing did, it obviously just makes the ball move more, and it mm -hmm. allowed me to be much more aggressive in the middle, hat, middle part of the plate, mm -hmm. um, which totally changed my mindset as a, as a pitcher. I didn't have to be so fine. My first three years, I think, you know, it's a compounding problem when you, when you feel like your fastball is too straight and not hard enough. So you have to be super fine with it, right? Yeah. And kind of get and scared the, of leaving it over the plate. It, and exactly, and then you and then you try to be super fine and you miss, <clears> and now you're down one zero, yeah, two zero, right. and and you don't have the the stuff to be able to get it by anybody. <laughs> one zero, one zero, hitters counts, yeah, and hitters for counts. Disaster. And so it totally changed everything because I had the ball moved enough that I could throw right for the middle of the plate, let it run where it was, whatever it was going to run early in the count, get a lot of foul balls, a lot of ground balls. Mm. And I'd end up, you know, I, I ended up a, a, a quite often 0-1 with a foul ball, right? right? I wasn't necessarily making guys mi like fully miss, but mm -hmm. I was making guys miss enough mm -hmm. um, that it put me in better pitchers' counts. And then I could, you know, I knew how to pitch. I, I could throw a couple different pitches for strikes and things like that. So once mm -hmm. I got people down, I could, I could, um, you know, manage to, you know, figure out a way to get them out. That makes a lot of sense. I think that's a, a huge thing too, is just having the confidence to attack the strikes, like you were saying, and. You know, that extra movement sometimes that'll that'll do it for you when you do when yeah. you work or something like that. So and sometimes there's a mental thing, right? Yeah. I should have had the confidence before. I still should have. Thrown but it's, the it's tough. Yeah. It is tough. But it that's, is tough. So that's that's a good lesson for guys for sure. Um, so let's you know kind of transition. Talk a little bit about what you're what you're doing now because you know with Game Changer you're obviously doing some pretty cool stuff there. I was actually talking to um, some pictures I was working with who were kind of we were talking a little bit about playing at the next level and we started talking about you know balancing baseball with the academic side of it and I mentioned how. Um, you want to be well-rounded and have other things you're interested in outside of baseball. And a lot of the guys I played with in college and the pros, it wasn't just baseball. They had other interests outside of that. And a lot of those guys have gone on to, uh, now they were still able to, to stay committed to developing and becoming an elite level pitcher, but they still have those other interests and they've gone on to do some pretty cool things when their playing days were over. Um, and you obviously, you know, you're a great example of that. So talk a little bit about, you know, life after baseball for you and, and how Game Changer got started. Yeah, you know, the life after baseball is 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 an, it's sort of interesting. I think that um, when I when when I after I got released um, from the Indians and then you know for a couple months sort of hung on to the dream of maybe getting picked up by another organization or maybe playing independent ball. I'm sure that you know in retrospect this is the same exact thought process that every ball player that defines themselves as a right. ball player. Yeah, what now? What do I do? Um, yeah, yeah and, and, and no longer can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, the what now and the, and really just the, the, the how you look at yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You know, for a long time, I, I considered myself <laughs> an athlete, a ball player, right. and, and all of a sudden, and, you know, like snap and think with one phone call, I no longer was. Right. Um, and had to, had to come to grips with that. And, and, it, and it doesn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. Right, it doesn't happen yeah. overnight at all. Um, but I think that over time, what I've come to realize, and it's probably just comes with age and maturity, and I'm sure Phil, you, you see the same thing, is that you realize that sort of the, the even the pe people that have a quote career in baseball, mm -hmm. right? right? They their careers end, and they're they've got half their life left, and right. those are the people that play for forever. Right, right. Yeah. For as long as you know, you know, 
I mean, like for instance, the whole Mario and Rivera sort sure. of like, I was like retirement yeah, stuff same thing. is just fascinating. I mean, he's a guy <laughs> who obviously has been like probably the best ever at the position that I played, you know, a short mm-hmm. reliever or whatever. And he had the greatest career of anyone in that. Right. And he's what, 42? Yeah, right. right? I mean, Which it seems it, ancient it, for, a, for a baseball yeah, player. But it seems ancient for a baseball it. player and it seems like young. You're for, kind of just starting out or you're kind just of starting your stride. Out career. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so I think that um, that that in, in that sense, you know, that even in the best case, it's not going to be. And, and I think you see a lot of, of former athletes that can't come to grips with the fact they're not an athlete anymore, and they can't right. sort of move on and, and do something that um, that that they that they're challenged by and that they really love. And I, I've been lucky enough to find that. You know, the origin of Game Changer came from the fact that I was I was bitten by the entrepreneurial bug at, at a pretty early age. Mm-hmm. So, like, after, as you probably know, as so I was playing ball um, in college and then and then in the minor leagues. My brother and I were, were running a sports camp. Right. Um, it turned into a camp. It was more clinics and lessons and, yeah. and things like that back at home um, to do as an off-season gig to be able to work with kids and stay close to the game. And it was a flexible schedule allowed us to work out and, and do everything right. we need to do to prepare for spring training um, or the, our college, college season or whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. So that was, you know, I looked at myself as more of a player and a coach at that point. But what was happening is I was getting bitten by that entrepreneurial bug and really loved the business side of it, too. So fast forward a number of years, I ended up going back to school, which, you know, speaking of the academic part, you know, going back and getting my MBA was an incredibly positive experience mm-hmm. because I could, I could be good at those two other things. I could be good at, good at the academics and, right. then, and also good at the social. And still have that, right? Made up, the distraction of baseball. Yeah, the, made, up, made up that it. lost time. And I right. remember uh, <laughs> and it's yeah. something I really recommend, especially to former, at, former college athletes who, you know, you lose that, that 2.30 p.m. to 7 p.m. window of your day. You're right. on, you know, you're at yeah, the, the athletic facilities. And all of a sudden I had that. And it was like, <laughs> it was like I had a whole other third of the day. To, right you know, to do what I wanted to do and stuff. So went to business school and then started working in technology. And, and Game Changer really was at the crossroads of these different backgrounds I had, the sports, the entrepreneurship, and then the, the technology. And, um, and so anyway, so that, you know, that was the origin of it. And I, it really was about trying to, to leverage mobile and, and web hmm. tools to solve what I thought were the real sort of pain points in the industry uh, of like the, in the amateur game. And those, those two pain points, pretty simply, are that coaches and scorekeepers have really archaic tools for managing the most painful part of their job, I think, which is the sort of the calculation of like the scorekeeping, the calculation of stats, reporting to local newspaper, doing anything with those stats to make them valuable to help you um, you know, help you help your players and things like right. that. I, I felt like that could be that problem could be solved using mobile technology. Hmm. And then the second problem that I saw was that parents and fans um, of those teams followed their their favorite teams and players with such incredible passion, right? Hmm. Um, but yet had nowhere close to the same tools that you and I take for granted to be able to follow our favorite professional teams. Right. And I felt like if I solved problem number one, which is create you know, an app that mm-hmm. replaced paper and pencil scorekeeping, then you could collect the data that would then fuel a great fan experience um, to be able to stay connected to that team and to that game. Makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, obviously you've, you guys have, have sort of taken off here. Um, and just the fact that you guys are now used by thousands and thousands of, of coaches and teams and, you know, two million games scored. Um, I'm sure that presents you know, a lot of challenges, and I'm sure it's been a, a sort of a whirlwind last few years here for you. Um, but what would you say? I mean, it's also got to be have some cool things about it too. The fact that you're now, you know, what you have sort of created is now in the hands of all of these people and helping you know improve the experience for for players and and coaches and everyone out there. So, what would you say is the coolest thing for you about running Game Changer? Yeah, you know, I mean, I think. Um... There's no doubt the coolest thing is being able to provide a great experience for the people that mm-hmm. use the product, right? And, and I'll get notes all the time from either coaches that say, hey, you know, I used to take 45 minutes after every game to total up all my stats, and I'd mm-hmm. sit on hold calling the local newspaper, and now I spend that time with my kids and my family, mm-hmm. and you've given me 
you've given me time back with my yeah, family or huge. or a note you know a note from somebody in Afghanistan you know mm-hmm. a, a mom or a dad uh, we've got several you know emails and stuff from people saying hey I'm you know I'm in a war zone and I can go open up a laptop and follow my kids game back yes. in you know Charleston South Carolina like yeah. play by play and the That's kids pretty. 10 the kids 10 yeah. right so 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 that that part's really cool mm-hmm. um, you know, you mentioned that like what we've achieved is funny. I, I think that maybe like any other athlete, you do, you know, you spend very little time thinking about what you've achieved, and you just want you want to continue to <laughs> get better and achieve more. Yeah. You know, and um, <clears throat> you know, we face a lot a lot of challenges, and and we we've overcome a number of them. And um, but we have you know really big we have big big plans for this product and big mm-hmm. plans for for this company. So. So I spend most of my time sort of looking forward. That's awesome, man. Um, so I, just got, I got one more question for you. Yeah. Just kind of going back to baseball real quick, because you, know, you mentioned you've had a lot of experience dealing with parents and you know, used to, to do the camps and still heavily involved with those guys. So yep. you, you, you know a lot about what, what parents are dealing with when they just want to provide um, you know, a good experience for their kids and do everything they can to help their kids get better. So what advice would you give um, to parents out there who just want to do you know, whatever they can to help their sons reach their dream of, of playing at that next level, whatever that le- next level may be. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I feel very lucky. I'll, I'll just speak from, you know, maybe the, the experience that I, that I really, um, that really shaped me the most was, was with my parents. And I think that that, that leads into to what the way I, the way I give guidance to the, to the parents, whether it's of a, of a high school ball player who's in the middle of a recruiting process or a little leaguer who's trying to, you know, <laughs> Um, get more playing time or whatever it might be, and, and that is that um, you know the athlete that is that is having fun. I mean, you said it a few minutes ago, right? The athlete that's having fun um, is the athlete that's that's going to play play his or her best. And um, I, after every game, my, you know, my parents never questioned what happened in the game. Maybe it was a good thing that they weren't, you know, they didn't grow up as baseball people or or yeah. whatever. It was, you know, did you have fun? Did you play your, you know, did you play your hardest? Right. Um, that's great. Let's go get something to eat. You know. <laughs> yeah. And it wasn't yeah. that they were disconnected. They were at every game, mm. right? I mean, I felt very, you know, they drove me to practice. They did whatever they they needed to do. But it, but it was, um, it was never criticized, never questioned, mm. um, never questioned coaches. Mm. Um, it was one hundred percent support and 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 wanting me to have fun. Um, the only times when so they they sort of question was when maybe my commitment was waning to something right, right? Oh, I want to go to beach week instead of you know play on my <laughs> legion team or whatever it was like yeah. no 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 if you made a commitment to the team right. you made a commitment to the team and that's it and there's no questions asked about that mm. um, so th- that would be that would be my guidance you know I think that 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 really when it comes down to it is it's got to it has to be the um, the athlete even for a young athlete mm. they have to take ownership in their mm-hmm. athletic experience, right? Um, you know, my brother and I always have a, a funny thing that, you know, through running camps and teams and all this stuff and, and with thousands and thousands of kids over the past, you know, many, many years, mm-hmm. um, the, the telltale sign of, um, of sort of, an, of, a, of, a, of a parent that, that maybe isn't parenting the right way with our kid mm-hmm. is, the, is the parent that carries the equipment bag, right? And, um, and meaning the kid's equipment bag. So the kid is walking, but the parent has like the glove in one hand and the equipment bag in the other hand. Uh-huh. And it's not that, you know, parents shouldn't help, but it's that, that, that that's a parent that isn't letting the kid take ownership of their, mm-hmm. their athletic experience. And it starts with the little things like remembering your hat glove, carrying your own bag. Right. And I've always found that like the kids that, that did that, they, they actually got more pleasure in the success mm. because they felt like they owned it, um, mm. as opposed to sort of performing for mom or mom right. or dad because yeah. mom or dad owned this experience and were living through their kid. Right. That's so cool. um, this is just a little anecdote. That's an that, interesting that point. I yeah, I never yeah. really thought of it that way, but that's very true for sure. You know, I think that's that's great advice for people out there and, and parents to kind of. I, I know my parents were the same way, just very supportive and never critical, and um, you know, if, if the the kid loves. The game and has that kind of inkling to 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 get better. Just kind of encourage them and and nurture that and let them take it on for themselves. So 
Um, yeah. I totally agree with you there. All right, man. So um, this has been awesome. I'm going to go ahead and make sure I get, um, you know, all the Game Changer info on the, the site below the video. So just, you know, before we wrap, maybe tell guys where where would you send guys to learn more about Game Changer? Would it be yeah, just go, go to our website. It's GameChanger.io. So it's not .com. It's GameChanger.io. Or you could go to GC.io, which is a shortened link, but it'll take you right there. That's our website. Um, everything you need to know is there. And then you could also, if you have um, a smartphone or a tablet, you can search Game Changer in the um, in the you know iTunes app store and um, and you'll find us there as well. All right, man, this has been great. Um, Ted, thanks so much. You've been awesome. And uh, you know, I know you're a busy man, so really appreciate you taking the time out. My pleasure. Thanks, Phil. Take right, care. You got it, Ted. You too. Yeah.